Okay, thank you, Max, and, um, and thank you, everyone, for, for being here and listening to me today um, about how humanitarian organisations' operations have to do better. Germany has borne the brunt of um, population movements for a long time. Um, you have been one of the greatest supporters for refugees in the world, bar none, over the last few years. But that being said, we have an obligation as a humanitarian organisation, um, UNHCR, UN Refugee Agency, to see how we can do better, to see how we can use technology not only to perform better, but also ultimately to provide better protection and assistance to, to refugees. As you know, doubt aware from looking at the TV, uh, from looking at the newspapers, looking at the web, uh, people being forced to flee their homes, often to unknown destinations. The way the world is heading, that situation is going to get worse with climate change, environmental degradation, increasing xenophobia, nationalism, and assorted constraints. Our job within the UN Refugee Agency is to provide protection and assistance to those people who do not have any. Along with other humanitarian organisations and host governments, our job is to deliver life-saving support to ensure survival and safeguard fundamental human rights and help develop solutions that mean uprooted people can build a better future. And I think this is one of the biggest challenges. How do we use technology to sustain people's lives, provide them with a future? In the next few minutes, we'd like to talk more about why we need to change the way we are working from being mostly reactive because if you look at refugees, if you look at humanitarian operations, if you look at natural disasters, what we do is we react, we respond. Not necessarily in the most efficient and effective ways. We mobilise resources, we mobilise teams, we try and get to the front lines as soon as possible, but there has to be better ways of doing this. What we're looking at is to try and find out, via the use of big data, analytics, uh, technological advancements, how we can be much more efficient and effective. As you no doubt, predictive analytics is particularly important as it uses data, statistical algorithms and machine learning techniques to make predictions about unknown future events based on historical data. The goal is to go beyond knowing what has happened, which we often focus on, such as observing patterns and trends to providing a best assessment of what will happen in the future and influence it. Of course, predictive analytics is not an absolute science, but it can give us indications of what's about to happen. There's already no shortage of, of models. There's models on climate change, there's models on the impact of related environmental impacts, on food security, the likelihood of rates of recurrence of civil conflict, um, the nature of protracted displacement, demographics, urbanisation. But what, what is missing is linking all this together. I'm the first to admit that there are significant challenges using predictive analytics to anticipate forced displacement, not least of which is political sensitivity among concerned states. Another is that there is often not one event that causes someone to leave their home. People are on the move for all sorts of reasons, some highly dependent on the context. And what we're seeing at the world at the moment, we're seeing climate change, we're seeing nationalism, we're seeing xenophobia, all complicating the movements and the, the context in which people um, make decisions. Increasingly, the adverse effects of climate change and environmental degradation interact with the drivers of refugee movements including conflict of violence. The effect of climate change can and is acting as a threat multiplier, aggravating conflict and compounding pre-existing vulnerabilities. 
While climate change is no doubt a key driver for future displacement, it cannot be seen entirely in, in isolation. We must do more to understand future contexts, the interlinkages, and how we must position ourselves differently to provide different services to those we need to serve. This is just an example of some of the, the challenges that we have to um, face in the modern world when we're looking at what is likely to impact on refugees and forced displacement in the future. This relates to the world economy, but it could just as well relate to the drivers of, um, of displacement. This comes from the Economist Unit. It looks at extreme weather events. It talks about, about social instability. It talks about polarisation of societies. It talks about demographics, rising income and wealth disparity. But how can we, as humanitarian organisations, also start using these models to anticipate and better prepare for the future? If we take the example of just from last week, an example which can demonstrate that we can make improvements if we take data, predictive analytics, um, seriously. What happened last week, as you no doubt are aware from Cyclone Fanny, it represented a clear example of how decision makers use technology and a massive amount of historical data to anticipate the, the, the storm's path. But having the data in the analysis is not sufficient. Those responsible, the relevant authorities in India and Bangladesh, must have the courage and conviction to act upon the information that has been provided. This is what the authorities did. They mobilised tens of thousands of people. They put a million people plus in evacuation shelters, thereby saving hundreds if not thousands of lives. This is particularly important for um, UNHCR and other humanitarian agencies because where this flight path was going, where the cyclone's flight path, was basically going very close to one of the world's largest refugee camps, a Kutabalong camp in Bangladesh. In 1999, as you're probably also aware, a similar cyclone, super cyclone, hit almost the same area and resulted in some 10,000 deaths. I'm not saying that predictive analytics was the sole cause for the reduction in, in the number of people who, who, um, who died, because there's obviously improvements in satellites, uh, imagery, there's improvements in evacuation shelters, there's improvements in communications. But being able to predict the flight path of the cyclone, being able to anticipate the directions, did lead to a reduction in the human suffering. While the use of meteorological data and technology to forecast weather has been commonplace for a long time, it's important that we realise the basis for the forecasting and where that comes from. Why can't humanitarian agencies be as efficient and effective um, looking at the future? One of the challenges that we have it often is getting the data. We often lack access to the sites, the locations, where refugees are located, often because it's um, logistically difficult or there's ongoing conflict. There's also a lack of historical data. Often we only have one or two years data to um, inform the modelling. There's a lack of quality data. Often it's almost impossible for us to obtain the data sets in a, in a machine usable form. And there's a lack of open data. Often agencies are not willing to share data uh, for a common good. But what, what I often see as being one of the biggest challenges for using predictive analytics and modelling for refugees and other elements is a lack of ambition, a lack of ambition about what is possible. The default of many is to do nothing rather than to try something new and fail. The easy option, and we see this time and time again, is to continue business as usual. The discussion on climate change is a classic example of that. What we will demonstrate today, hopefully, is that there is a place for predictive analytics and other technologies, and we need to build the confidence of decision makers to trust in the results of the modelling, and most importantly, to act. A challenge, whether about discussing climate change or the potential for significant population movements, is to be able to move decision makers out of their comfort zones, provide them with the confidence that they can make a difference, 
and without freaking them out that we are about to enter a cataclysmic or Mad Max Beyond the Thunderdome type environment. How do we do that? How do we use predictive analytics? How do we use big data to influence uh, responses? I'll give you three scenarios, three case studies. One is the work that we did in relation to um, the movement of Syrians and others to Europe in 2015-2016. Uh, what, what we sought to do was understand the size, speed and characteristics of the movement, particularly as we approached the winter months. At this time, I was head of UNHCR's operations in Jordan. We had about a million Syrians there. Um, there was another couple of million scattered around other locations, including Turkey and elsewhere. We had to, have, we had to try and find out what was the likelihood and what were the drivers of, of the populations moving. And once they, moved, once they started moving towards the Mediterranean, what was likely to be the time frame for them to actually move across? By using met data, including weather conditions and sea, sea wavelength, the team was able to successfully predict the number of crossings, arrivals in the Mediterranean Sea within five days in advance. This allowed us to put much more targeting, my headphones are coming off, <laughs> much more targeting uh, and, and preparedness for arrivals. Another example where we've used AI and PA um, and also big data to, was to understand future trends for asylum applications for Venezuelans. The analysis consisted of reviewing social media, particularly Twitter, and using machine learning based computer program to assess intentions to flee. The choice of Twitter, yeah, there we go. My head is too big. <laughs> um, the analysis consisted of reviewing social media, particularly Twitter, and using machine learning based computer programs to assess the, the intentions to flee. The choice of Twitter instead of other social media channels, including Facebook, was due to the fact that Twitter had a special data sharing agreement with the UN, particularly one of our close partners, which is UN Global Pulse, to use their public API for humanitarian purposes. At the same time, we also collected another source for big data, Google searches via Google Trends platform. It wasn't that challenging when it comes down to it. There's a lot of, obviously, um, uh, metrics involved there, but we just, you can actually do a lot of good work relatively simply. Some of the things in, in Venezuela which we did using social media, we just looked at like searches for asylum, searches for asylum applications, words for um, flee, for escape, against specific geographical areas within Venezuela. We then correlated those in a time series, the actual number of ap asylum applications across the region, and we, we train the computer accordingly. If you sort of see the, um, uh, well, actually this one, yeah, <coughs> this is Venezuela, um, you can sort of see the, the drop in um, numbers of uh, asylum applications on the right hand side there. What that was leading to was basically a, um, a closure of the borders. So while we can get um, data, while we can get insights by using um, um, big data, we still need to follow up with looking at what's happening on the ground, ground truthing the situation. We also look at the, the, the tweets, um, we look at the, the, the emotional context of the tweets, um, the, the example of the tweet which we've got there, which was found by the machine, which basically tr in translation to English says, I want to cry, I'm very afraid, I don't know what my life is going to be from now on, I love you Venezuela, but now what I need is to flee. So even though it's machine learning, even though it's um, looking at big data, it does give us the opportunity to get an insight into the feelings, um, emotions, uh, context of the individuals who may be about to move. The third example is Somalia. In 2007, actually the third example was also looking at the intentions in, um, in Syria. Um, but the third example, the, the, the largest one, which we've been doing quite a lot of work on, is in Somalia, um, 2017, it was faced with its second or third year of consecutive droughts. And we were asked by our field teams in both Somalia and Ethiopia about what should they be expecting. So what we did was we um, put together some variables. 
We looked at what had happened previously, including in 2011. And in 2011, they, the area experienced a very similar situation. Uh, multiple years of drought, um, civil conflict, challenges in access to um, uh, humanitarian agencies to, um, to get support in there. And the result of that situation in 2011 was that we had approximately 100,000 people move to camps in neighbouring Ethiopia in a place called Dolo Adu, which is up here. <laughs> not being properly prepared for that and not really anticipating the numbers of people that were coming across meant that we didn't have sufficient resources, we didn't have um, staff, we didn't have the operation um, in place to provide the necessary support. And as a consequence, people suffered, people died. Given that we're facing a similar situation in 2017, we had to do whatever was necessary to avoid a similar situation. We had the data, we had the variables, we had the insights, we had to um, explore about how we could be more proactive. So what we did was we looked at um, different elements, different data sets, we looked at historical population um, movements, we looked at climate and, and weather data, rain, river levels, we looked at violence data, we looked at market prices of different elements. And one thing which is interesting is that we, we didn't go overboard with the amount of data we're looking to collect. We're looking at what was important to drive Somalis um, to a neighbouring country, because refugees never want to leave their homes unless they ha absolutely have to. So the situation was that we spoke to Somalis in Ethiopia, in Doladu, we, we tried to get as much information about the likelihood population movements coming from their own towns and villages um, in Somalia. But some of the things also that we did was we looked at, you can see here, um, water tanks, water containers. Uh, they also had goats. We looked at the prices of goats in the markets in Somalia. And when the prices of goats um, went down, what we saw was the flooding of the market of people getting rid of their goats prior to moving uh, onwards, because goats was, a very, was, a, was basically one of the key assets that Somali populations had, families had. So when people started getting rid of 50 or 60 goats uh, at a time, that had an impact on the prices in Somalia, uh, and the market prices in Somalia, and we could then have an indication that there may be movements of people uh, leaving because they were getting rid of their assets. At the same time, you would have prices of water containers going up because they needed the water containers in order to move water to, to head towards um, uh, Ethiopia and elsewhere. The end result of this um, modelling was that uh, when we started, um, we started looking at getting pretty close within 10%, but as, as time went on, we started getting very close in regards to the predictions of the number of people to arrive in uh, neighbouring Ethiopia versus what the machine actually had anticipated. An interesting side from that was that the machine indicated that it should be about 15 to 20,000 Somalis on the move. And we had the teams of Doluaru in Ethiopia prepared to receive this population. We waited for a week, they didn't arrive. We waited for two weeks, they didn't arrive. We had for three weeks, they didn't arrive. So then we, we, what we did was we said, okay, they must be stuck somewhere. So then we looked at satellite imaging. And so if you look at, whoop, try and go back. If you look at, um, Dolo Aru is up here. So it's a very remote area. We've got, we've got large refugee camps there. And we expected people to be moving from Badoa up this route to Dolo Aru. So inaccessible for humanitarian operations, but we needed to understand what was happening with the population. So what we started to do was then we started tasking satellites, and this was the, the range of the satellites at that time. Now satellite coverage is basically much more omnipresent. Um, I spoke to Planet last week. If you haven't heard about Planet, they're a great organisation. They've got 120 satellites um, uh, orbiting the Earth at any time, taking photos of every uh, square metre every day. But back in 2017, this was the range of the, uh, the satellites that we had uh, tracking Somalia. So we actually had to retask the satellites in order to look at this area between Badoa and Doluadu. What we found, though, was that 
we thought, because here you can actually see Al Shabaab checkpoints. So we thought, okay, Al Shabaab is probably blocking them to access towards Dol Adu in Ethiopia. And so we kept looking around for the populations and using the satellites, using the satellites, which should automatically come up, <laughs> but not, but using the satellites, we're actually able to find that the um, populations were in um, a town called Luke, which is here. We assumed that um, Al Shabaab was blocking the refugees leaving the, leaving the area. But what actually happened was that by talking to the refugees and talking to their relatives in Ethiopia, here we go, we found them, um, in Ethiopia, we're actually able to find that there was a cash assistance program in Somalia which was actually stabilizing the population. So by using data, by using predictive analytics to anticipate population movements and then using satellite imagery, we were able to get a good handle on what was going on to this population and then encourage more support to that area and then avoid people having to become refugees. So this is the type of engagement and the use of big data and analytics which actually led to a um, decrease in populations moving across to Ethiopia and the ability to sustain them there for as long as they possibly could. Let's <clears throat> I'll be wrapping up soon. Um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, the humanitarian sector yep, is often characterised by managers making difficult choices with very little time and very little data. What we're trying to do is to encourage managers, not only from humanitarian organisations but um, um, state authorities, to look at the technologies which are currently available and use them in a way which, is, which can be more efficient, more effective. We're now in a situation where we might be able to predict population movements and potential risks to vulnerable populations. But how will and does this influence humanitarian organisations to actually change their programs, redirect investments, realign priorities to emerging areas of risks? And will donors follow by providing the necessary financial resources? Predictive analytics within humanitarian organisations is only as effective as its organisational readiness for changing its strategic decision making. We might be able to predict future risk, but how will and does this influence humanitarian organisations to actually change programs, redirect investments um, and do a better job? So the basic point what we've, what we've got from is that predictive analytics offers us opportunities which we've never had before to not only plan, assess, but also to act much more decisively in regards to protecting and assisting populations of concern. And for us not to be engaged more in predictive analytics and strategic foresight and horizon planning and the other technologies which are now uh, available to us basically makes us negligent. N negligent not only for uh, the people uh, who, are most, who are entrusting their well-being to us, but negligent to ourselves because we're mandated to do whatever we can to protect and assist populations. And with predictive analytics, I believe we can do that. A key element, though, which we have in, when we're looking at data is that it's not just data. When we talk about data, when we talk about statistics, when we talk about um, PA, um, machine learning, we have to put it at the, at the centre that we're talking about human beings. And we do not spend enough time looking at what, 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 are, what are the contexts that um, people find themselves, what are their concerns, what are their hopes, how would they see um, the world in the future? So there's a lot of discussions at the moment in regards to neocolonialism, in regards to humanitarian organisations dictating uh, what future responses should be. All I'm saying here is with predictive analytics, um, using machine learning and, and other technologies which we've never had before, they need to be used in a way which supplements our, relations, our relationships with the individuals and continues to put them at the front. So thank you. Andrew Harper, vielen Dank. Gibt es denn noch Fragen? Are there any questions to Andrew? So raise your hands and I come to you. No. Good. No. <laughs> so. Oh, that's it. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, 
Hi, um, my name is Natalie. Um, so I'm curious, you know, obviously when it comes to creating data and predictive analytics, there's a lot of questions around privacy, the weaponization of data. And, you know, if you're predicting where refugees are moving, I'm curious what kind of safeguards does UNHCR have in place to safeguard that data so it doesn't get weaponized yeah. later? Yeah, uh, um, it's a very good point. So, so the question was, what does UNHCR do to safeguard the data? This is like, I've got a, there will be another discussion over the next couple of days on, on digital identity, on, on other elements. Data protection is at our very core. We are a protection agency. If we do not do whatever is necessary to protect data, then our credibility, and most importantly, trust with the individual is gone. So we are, um, we're at the forefront in regards to uh, data security, data protection, putting people's rights in, um, at, the, at the center of every decision that we make. And again, we, we can't afford to stuff up, so to speak, um, because the consequences are severe. We, we know very well that because we deal with refugees, the, the very governments that often force them to leave are interested in what's happening to them. So we know that people are after this data. So this then becomes a question in relation to the interoperability of data, sharing of data. So what we're looking at here, and this is where with the predictive analytics, it's a bit easier for us, is because we're looking at very much at aggregated sets, we're looking at metadata. But certainly on the individual um, uh, data side of things, we've, we're at the forefront of data protection. Um, we'll do whatever is necessary to ensure that our credibility, our trust um, is, is maintained with the individuals. Thanks. So, any more questions? Yeah.